Today's presentation is hookworm history in soils in North Carolina, massive infection and intervention, 1910 to 1915. Our presenter is Alice Anderson, PhD, an associate professor in the Department of Health, Education, and Promotion. Dr. Anderson has been at ECU for nine years. Since in 1915, there weren't any talkies yet. I'm going to start with some music. We'll just go through. And I'm not going to talk that much, but I just want to kind of give you an idea about the era and some of the things that happened. Um, one of the things that my husband is really interested in is the Titanic, and uh, he has about all the Titanic books that there were, and of course uh, hated the movie terribly, thought that was awful, a travesty. But <laughs> um, the women's suffrage movement was something else, and conveyor belt technology, um, the Rockefeller Colorado Fuel and Iron Corporation is especially relevant because he's part of this uh, fight against uh, hookworm. And then just a couple scenes from North Carolina raising chickens, uh, lunch in the farm field, and the uh, expansion of the railroad, which opened a lot of different opportunities and experiences for people who lived in the coastal area and in the Piedmont. And then um, some of the uh, economic movements here, the News and Observer and uh, the Bloomsbury Park trolley in uh, Raleigh, one of the things that the News and Observer did at the time was to not do, well, no, what they didn't do was to write about anything negative because there were uh, politicians who didn't want development to stop, so they actually had a lot of influence over what the newspaper did. And that's also relevant to the hookworm situation. Um, and then, of course, uh, the war in de declaration in 1917. So one of the things that um, you can start with with history, of course, is the beginning of um, hookworm in mummified bodies, and apparently there is actual evidence of hookworm infection in Egyptian mummified remains. And there are medical writings that have uh, information about hookworm in 1808. And one of the things about hookworm and other diseases in the the parts of the country where it was common is that it was confused with malaria and often it was also part of a, a whole syndrome of infection that people had and caused the, the kind of sickness that uh, affected people's productivity. And one of the things that um, started out in the uh, U.S. Army Medical Corps was that in the early years, um, Ashcroft, who was a U.S. Army Medical Corpsman, actually did some work in Puerto Rico. And in the history, <laughs> history the spelling is P-O-R-T-O Rico, Puerto Rico, which I thought was kind of fun, and um, did some treatment in 1899. And then the next really a major thing that occurred was this report on the prevalence and ge geographic distribution of hookworm disease in the United States. And one of the things that it says uh, in this report is that Stiles, who was also with the, uh, the uh, medical marine hospital and the U.S. Hygienic Laboratory, actually said that he found some uh, disease in Texas and um, Georgia and North Carolina and drew a line between those three points and said below this line is where the disease occurs. This is the distribution. So that was the, the kind of, uh, I guess, epidemiological way of doing things at the time was rather loose and, you know, not exactly what we would do today, obviously, but um, that was what he, he wrote about. 
And one of the things uh, about hookworm is that it was a disease that was hidden, and one of the reasons is because, again, it was confused with uh, mosquito-borne disease, probably um, malaria for the most part, because it was a chronic condition. And when it got to be, when anemia got to be uh, a major problem with these, some of the patients, they actually died. Um, it was also called the laziness germ in a lot of these reports. And if you finally are able to read that newspaper article, you'll see that they refer to this, to hookworm disease, as the laziness germ. And again, it was uh, one of the many things that people suffered from in the, in the area of the southeast and, of course, in South America as well and other places in the world. Um, so the important thing also about the whole hookworm history story is that it is a part of the development of public health in the United States. And um, a lot of the states that had hookworm infection were the first uh, to organize their, their states in terms of public health. Um, so it is a distinct chapter of the infectious disease drama in medicine as well and the uh, introduction of public health as a community service. Some of the um, state of North Carolina historical records that you can find uh, have Mr. Stiles' um, records and some of the publications that he actually came up with. And um, this is just the, the listing from the North Carolina historical records. One of the things that I wanted to do was also to include some of the other southeastern states and get a, a more, a broader picture of hookworm infection. Um, and in the 1903 Stiles report, which sort of started this whole thing, um, he, sa <laughs> he says that uh, he was trained in medicine in France and came to the United States and he said he was just uh, totally astounded at the uh, extravagant riches that some people in the United States lived in. And so he, he really was concerned about the, the people in the Southeast who seemed to be living in much poorer conditions, obviously a lot of uh, holdover from the Civil War and Reconstruction. Um, so he was very concerned about this and then became interested in hookworm as one of the possible reasons that the farm labor situation was so bad in the southeast. So that was one of the driving forces behind all this. Um, and he was granted permission by um, the Marine Medical Hospital to travel from Washington, D.C. to Florida sampling for hookworm. And that's what he did. And it's also interesting to, to see how this uh, came about in his report, he, he said he deduced, and although those of you who are all scientists know that deduction is fine, but you need some data. So when he started, he deduced, as I said, from this line that he drew, uh, that it was going to be uh, fairly common in the Southeast. And one of the things that he discovered and came up with it in his report was the actual species of uh, hookworm that was common in the United States. And he also had a uh, description of the fact that it was very common in sand districts and not cities or clay districts. And one of the interesting things is later on, one of the scientists in this whole um, movement said he could distinguish by just looking at people where they came from. And this was because people, he thought, uh, who had exposure to hookworm had a certain look about them. So he could tell at, this is sort of his party trick, he, was, he could tell whether people had lived where they lived based on how their, their physiognomy was. So I guess that was a common thing, but it was an interesting approach to medicine as well. Um, and at the same time, um, President Roosevelt became concerned with the country life 
um, what is called the country life in, at the time. And he brought together men named Gates and Stiles and some other of Rockefeller's um, friends and wanted them to investigate the economic and social and sanitary conditions of country life throughout the United States. And one of the stories about when they were traveling on the railroad that was newly uh, laying in North Carolina, he, they stopped or slowed down at a railroad station between Goldsboro and Raleigh and saw what is called a misshapen man. And they described the the description of it goes through, you know, the kind of uh, physical symptoms that you would find in someone who had a heavy infection with a uh, hookworm. And it, what he was called a dirt eater. And this is another whole thing in, in Southern culture as well. Um, and they called it one of the more depressing elements in the South's chronic farm labor problems. So this is um, some idea of how people looked at the whole disease issue and the kind of commercial um, effects that there were from it. And so because of the, the noticing of some of these people along the way, uh, Stiles was stimulated to press the issue of hookworm and put it in terms of causing a farm labor shortage. And one of the things you see in the um, New York Times article is, it is called the fight to save two million lives from the hookworm. And um, this is one of the things that, uh, just a little bit of detail about what the disease can do. Um, it has been determined that uh, Nicator americanus produces a daily blood loss of 0.03 milliliters per worm. Uh, although others consider the loss to be a little bit greater. And um, for the other type of hookworm, the figure is 0.15 to 0.26 milliliters per day. And it translates to a loss of approximately three mils of blood per day in light infections and 100 per day with heavy infestations. Um, so this, again, is one of the, uh, the appearances, the kind of emaciated, except for the bloated um, stomach area. And I'm not sure exactly what he's got his hand on there, but. Chair. What is it? The chair. Oh, OK. Doesn't look very comfortable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That yeah, could be, definitely. Um, so as a result of all of this, the, the Rockefeller Commission was er for the eradication of hookworm was established. And in 1909, um, the education boards in the South and the Public Health Service and many other government agencies all signed on together. And this is one of the reasons that the data is a little bit scattered as well. Um, and again, the number of two million efficient, inefficient people will be made well. And it's amazing to think about, this is uh, one picture of the Country Life Commission. And some of these men became um, the Rockefeller Commission on the Eradication of Hookworm as well. And there are you know, quite a number of them here, but um, again, it's kind of hard to read what from this slide what those, who those people were, but there are quite a number of them. Um, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and other states, um, the public health agencies were in pretty bad shape, especially at the county level. And something that is, is kind of still a problem is that uh, people regard them as emergency agencies. There were still hurricanes and floods and something we don't have, of course, malaria and yellow fever outbreaks. And these uh, county health departments or health agencies, they weren't departments at the time, supplied relief from uh, some of the problems from these uh, environmental conditions. And the state boards had underpaid county representatives and little work could be done. And I think, you know, just a little bit of, uh, 
opinion here is that we still have some work to do to create some place, in some places, um, public health boards that uh, work well. We still have emergency agency thought and uh, certainly a lot more is being done now than it was then, but there's still some work to be done in organizing them. And um, in the North Carolina records, there are surveys and correspondence and administrative files concerning this whole campaign that North Carolina joined in with the commission, uh, the two commissions, and the State Board of Health and the Rockefeller Sanitary Commission both helped the, in the funding. And uh, Dr. John Farrell was a man who uh, became the Assistant Secretary for Hookworm Disease in North Carolina. And there, what, what they wanted to do was first determine the geographical prevalence of hookworm and do that with county surveys. And then second, they wanted to eradicate hookworm. And third, they wanted to um, promote sanitary reforms. And one of these articles talks about how many thousand, uh, like 60 or 70,000 pieces of paper were distributed to people in all of these different counties. Um, so there's a lot of information about the actual um, administrative setup of this whole procedure. And like some of the things that are done now, there was a central office in Raleigh, which was run by Dr. Farrell, and the State Laboratory of Hygiene, which had eight microscope technicians. And if you haven't seen them, there are some really nice microscopes in a case over uh, in the other hall, which are typical uh, of some of these things. I call um, anything in 1910 and earlier BP, which is before plastic, right? So the, those microscopes are just beautiful. It's like, I remember my clarinet when I was young, it was wood and brass, not plastic. But anyway, so there were the third administrative union here had a field survey and a dispensary system, five district directors and uh, the dispensaries and county surveys. Um, there are several people mentioned here who were three of the directors and the state paid for one doctor and three laboratory assistants and the Rockefeller Commission paid for the remaining personnel. And then they have the, the stages which really are extremely well organized, I thought. Um, but one of the first initial periods uh, in March to July was to collect samples from college students. And at this point in time, there was no permission needed. They just went and got, went into the colleges and knocked on the door and said, uh, give me a stool sample and we're, we're gonna find out about hookworm. And the state was divided into 19 sanitary districts and uh, again, literature was prepared to uh, educate the population. Um, this is a picture of one of the early sanitary um, laboratory physicians looking at a stool sample. And the second phase, um, these three doctors were hired for the district directors. And during the second stage, orphans and state guard were examined for hookworm disease. Um, this campaign was um, publicized to increase awareness, especially among teachers. And then finally, the, the third stage, uh, the district directors conducted county surveys by examining school children. And they also went out into the county and looked at at least 100 households in each county to look at what kind of sanitary um, conditions they had, what kind of privies they had, or if they had them at all, and tried to advise people and help them with actual um, wood and construction plans for constructing a decent um, privy or outhouse, as if you haven't heard of the word privy, but outhouse. So by the summer of 1911, 99 out of the 100 counties in North Carolina at the time were found to have people infected with hookworm. And um, one of the things that's interesting is in this um, poster, you must read this, the state of North Carolina and the county of Halifax, um, 
it tells people what is what's available absolutely free and um, take advantage of this great opportunity come to the dispensaries on the opening day bring your wives and children be examined and see if you have any of these diseases if you have the medicines they will give will cure no if you have the medicines they will give will I'm not sure how that's supposed to read will cure every case and bring about a wonderful change in your feelings all this without any cost to you whatever um, Dr. Covington will be in charge of the dispensary and they have doctors to show you this hookworm and their eggs under the microscope so they actually tried to educate people in what they were doing and how they could um, tell that they had hookworm without just running them through quickly. Um, and so these dispensaries opened in five counties, free dispensaries, and they said they took the furthest away communities from each of these five county points to examine and treat people for hookworms. And um, again, they looked at the sanitary conditions um, diagnosed this by examining fecal samples. They had people bring in, this bothered me for a while, you know, how were they going to sample all these people for hookworm? And apparently they asked them to bring in a fecal sample in a, in a you know, clean container. Um, and one of the things that they did when the patient's stool samples were positive was to give them Epsom salt to clear the mucus out of the intestine then they gave them thymol capsules to poison the um, hookworms, and then they gave them another dose of Epsom salt to clear out the worms and the thymol because uh, it's not a good thing to have inside for a long time. It's a, they advise people not to have gravy and biscuits. I guess that's not a good thing to go without when that's all you have, but um, this, is the, this is the cure. And they operated these things from four to six weeks in each county, and it was um, about 100 people a day came through these dispensaries. And in 13 counties, uh, they had finished work by September, and seven counties remained on the waiting list. And what was interesting about this Halifax County sign was when I show you the data later, um, Halifax County doesn't have any data for some reason. So that data was lost but there's still you know the invitation to come into the county um, the Rockefeller Foundation kept all these records which are kind of uh, anecdotal and recorded in various different ways on paper and put some of them on microfilm and the, the state of North Carolina kept a record of 35 counties that they have on a list of one of these uh, the state records and for most of the counties there the infection rate is 40 to 60 percent of the people sampled and you can extrapolate to the population which I, which was done and it uh, remains between 40 and, and 60 percent for most of these counties um, the ones that the um, information that I actually started with was these um, GIS files by this a person named Eric Thoman uh, who spent five days I think he said in the Rockefeller Foundation basement where all these records were kept because the Rockefeller Foundation did not want to release them or let go of them or anything so they, they he had to spend the time in the basement of the Rockefeller Foundation to look at these and um, he calculated the, the number or the percent infection in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, Georgia, and actually, um, I don't know if Alabama was included or not, but I, I'm kind of limiting my talk to the, the counties adjacent to us. Um, but he also wrote a report, which is online, and um, he, called himself a um, independent researcher. I believe he works for a private company, but this was his hobby to, to look through all of these records. And he said it was just like a massive uh, pile after pile of things in, in this uh, basement. 
Uh, so one of the things, again, that all of these events coming together were looking at was uh, Stiles as the evangelist for uh, curing hookworm disease and John Etling in this book in 1981 said that the dispensary was the revival uh, event for people in all of these counties to come together and have this wonderful cure and go, uh, go about feeling much better, much happier as a result of coming to these dispensaries. And so uh, this project that I was working on and did a publication on is just looking at imaging the distribution because I'm in environmental health and what I was interested in was environmental conditions and the distribution. And this is uh, from a book by Palmer and Reader and it was something that I found in the Mississippi Historical Society, a map of the overall distribution of Nicator americanus. And uh, you can see that all of the southeast, and not even southeast, but all the way up to Maine uh, is included here. So it's a little bit, you know, not really uh, as accurate as you might like. And this is the other um, species of hookworm and the distribution in the tropics, probably not quite as uh, inclusive or clear as you might like. And this is uh, Thoman's research transferred from all of those files into a GIS map. And what he did was to um, enumerate the hookworm disease in all of these counties all across to Texas and all the way up to Virginia. And the, the dark blue there is the high quartile of 50 to 100 percent infection um, and the second quartile, third quartile, and low quartile. So you can see just kind of generally what the distribution in all of the different counties of these states was. And then um, further he went into each of the states and did a map of each of the counties and I had somebody here put the names of the counties in there so I could tell where I was because I didn't know all the names of the counties. But So this is um, South Carolina, and this is the, the rate of infection again. Um, and these are percents down here in the uh, legend, but it's for some reason they, the uh, man I was working with, I'll have to ask you guys to put percents on this map for me, but they are files of the uh, states and how much infection there was. And you can see here, there's a little bit more heavy infection in North Carolina. And th this is supposed to be 50 to 100 percent again um, in that high amount. And um, Virginia. And there are, we have uh, maps for all the other states that were included as well, but these are the ones, again, that I was uh, looking for. And one of the things that I wanted to look at was um, this kind of comment that he said it was mostly in the sandy soil and not in clay soil, and that he could tell where a person lived by whether or not they had earmarks of hookworm infection just by looking at them and assigned them to some county or other based on their appearance. And one of the things that I did at this point was that I better get in touch with a geographer so that uh, the GIS work is going to be a little bit more accurate than I can do on my own. And one of the things you can do with um, GIS is look at all kinds of different um, data layers. And one of the newer things is uh, called ground penetrating radar. And what it uh, we thought might show is a pattern of clay and sand um, according to the electrical conductivity from moisture in the soil. So we wanted to look at that, uh, although some geographers downplay the usefulness of this because it varies with so many other abiotic factors. And it's something that's used to find buried artifacts. So those of you who are in, into history and want to look at buried um, Indian mounds or things like that. It really works well for that, apparently. And this just shows 
how a ground penetrating radar suitability map shows. Um, the suitability is related in some ways to the amount of groundwater. So it does show you a little bit about what kind of uh, drainage pattern there is in some of these areas. There's another GIS layer that um, illustrates hydric and non-hydric soils. And this we didn't feel gave us enough information. And we finally decided to go to the um, Statsco map, which is the, um, and I always forget this, this is a, is a United States actually soil geology state map. And you can get these and put them into ArcGIS and, and produce these maps for all of the states that they have information for. And a lot of them are updated to about 2006 and later. So they are really quite nice. The um, data that also that's used to produce these maps shows you um, the number of acres in each of the counties that actually are in each of these categories. So what we did was to take the number of acres in each of the counties that was very poorly drained and poorly drained and compared that with the moderately and well drained, um, not too many excessively drained areas, but uh, to look at that and see if the, the drainage characteristics would reflect the amount of clay and sand in each of those counties. So what we came up with was um, the counties that had a percent drainage from all the way from Hyde over to Nash and just in order of the percent drainage or, or well to moderately drained soil in each of the counties. So you would expect if this theory that we came up with was going to work that um, the better drained soils at the right hand side of this graph would be where the concentration of high hookworm infestation would be. So from Greene County all the way over to Nash County, including Onslow, Edgecombe, and so forth, were ones where we would expect to have that match up on the map with the uh, 50 to 100 percent infestation, remembering that the data was not exactly uh, collected in a, in a uh, scientific method um, that would, you know, had to have some, a lot of adjustment and interpretation in it. Um, and just to confuse things, I wanted to also look at the, how the population related to the, num the amount of moderately to well-drained soil. And this graph talks about um, the, these high quartile hookworm counties, Pitt, Pender, Bladen, and Brunswick, and what the population in 1910 was compared to the uh, percent of moderately drained uh, soil. So some of the places that you can see uh, where the, the drainage characteristics kind of affect or map or graph together with the population are these like uh, Pamlico and Jones and Carteret counties where populations are low and the amount of moderately to well-drained soil is low. But then there are some like um, Greene County here where the, the drain, well-drained soil is pretty high and the population is fairly low. So there it wasn't really a clear um, explanation or anything that I could make anything out of. There were just uh, a lot of differences. So I thought since we were doing imaging, what we would look at was just mapping the amount of uh, county soils that were moderately to well drained. And um, you can see that some of these areas over on the uh, left hand side, as you go from Onslow County up toward the Piedmont, uh, there, of course, is the Sand Hill area and some other areas that are fairly geologically apparently more uh, well-drained than obviously some of the hurricane flooded every time counties <laughs> over on the right-hand side. So it makes a lot of sense to look at it in that way. And some of these counties have really well-drained soils. So we looked at the counties with hook, hookworm infestation. You can see that there's a, there's a cluster here 
and there also are um, in areas there where there is well-drained soil. And so what we found, um, basically comparing the two, is that the, the high hookworm infestation is really not in the extremely highly drained areas, but in these kind of, uh, in the higher drainage areas, but there are also a couple like Pitt County, which is not in, in this highest group of uh, eastern counties that is moderately to well drained, but has or did have quite a high um, hookworm population. And Brunswick County was another one that had uh, low drainage. Of course, Brunswick is not as big a county as some of these, but um, so this is really what we came up with was that these areas that were in between on the high end had the highest populations of uh, hookworm. And as I mentioned earlier, Halifax County was one that didn't have any data in the Rockefeller records for some reason. So um, I would expect that to be one of these that um, had a high hookworm population. I'm sure I can find it somewhere. But um, there are some other evidence in the literature that there's an association between soil type and hookworm infestation um, in the Southern American states and in South Africa. Um, so some of these are fairly um, complex um, research um, articles compare, uh, controlling, excuse me, for socioeconomic factors and behavioral factors so that the, the other things are weeded out from the soil type. And this is the article that uh, I published with Dr. Allen at ECU about uh, the whole business of soil, drain soil drainage type and hookworm disease prevalence. And what we want to do is um, get some more data from the other um, states that we have these maps for and just continue and look and see if there is a, a, uh, a better um, you know, comparison between some of these other counties and other states and the soil types. But it's just going to take some, some more work, more graduate student work to count up all the acres of uh, types of soil drainage. And this is the 50 to 100 percent hookworm infestation uh, laid out on those counties. So there are some where it doesn't match and um, the, we, we didn't do the, these two entire counties. What counties are those? Does anybody recognize? I can never remember. It's not. Anyway, Pitt County, that I know. I actually used to work for the state uh, as a medical entomologist and had to go to all these counties and find out what their departments were doing their health departments with mosquito control. So most of them I've been to and have seen what goes on. Um, but this is the, you know, the high distribution. Now, uh, you, you might also think about the fact that uh, most of these counties had at least 40% um, and would be out of the 50 to 100% infestation. And 40% is still pretty high. So um, some of these other counties had fairly high populations of hookworm as well, just didn't get, make it to the 50 to 100%. Um, so some of the other characteristics that could be controlled for in a, in, a, in a more current study are the temperature and relative humidity, cultural practices, obviously uh, people who go barefoot don't have shoes. Apparently the Rockefeller Commission actually provided shoes for people when they went to these homes in each county. They provided shoes, they provided materials to build modern outhouses. And um, one of the things that um, looking at other countries that use human uh, waste for fertilizer is that people have recently found out that some of these organisms and eggs can last longer than the three to six months that is typically recommended for composting for human waste. So they have expanded the time, the recommendations, the World Health Organization has expanded the time for composting human waste to longer than three to six months, at least five to 10 months, I think was what they said. Um, so there's a, there's a whole 
issue of all of these different kinds of cultural practices. And of course, one of the things that I have to constantly um, reiterate is that there's not a systematic, systematically recorded bunch of evidence for this, but um, it's interesting to look at and see how they how it fits into a you know hypothesis that you have, and that sort of um, gives you an idea of some of the value of the uh, information or not. And I'm I just hate to see all this information go to waste. Try to do something with it and make some sense out of uh, the environmental measures and the environmental uh, conditions where all of these uh, hookworm cases took place. Um, in 1960. Someone at the state health department announced there were no more privies or outhouses in the state. And I know all of you who have been around for a while know that's absolutely not true. I mean, there are, <laughs> there are still outhouses in the state. There was one um, where I did some mosquito sampling in Pamlico County. The man had the very nicest outhouse that there ever was. But... Um, <laughs> Well, it was, you know, it wasn't falling down, let's say. <laughs> um, but we still have things like um, septic drainage, which one of the professors in our department is looking at with uh, how microorganisms and metals and various other chemicals move through the soil. And... Um, a lot of this animal waste still plagues water quality in, in areas of the state everywhere, and I'm sure that there are still some human waste problems. I don't think people uh, use the edge of the woods like they did, you know, before privies were common, but there still are. Pardon? They do on the interstate. I hope you're probably right. Oh. I don't know. It's like. Um, so the drainage business that uh, Dr. Humphrey is looking at is uh, one of the more interesting things that uh, environmental health is working on. And another thing that um, can change is the, the soil drainage condition with the global climate change. Either soil can get more saturated or less depending on which, where it is. And of course the weather obviously is changing a little bit. So. Um, one of the other problems is obviously just water itself in other disaster areas that don't have as much um, government help as we do here, although I think that's changing too, I don't know. Um, one of the things that can be done is looking at aerial photographs and this ground penetrating radar and various other kinds of um, mapping techniques that are available. and looking also at multiple infection with parasites and some of the conditions that people live in and some of the cultural practices like composting human waste. And another thing that interests me is how the co-infection with malaria and various intestinal parasites um, occurs in uh, many countries still and how this affects the kind of chronic conditions that people suffer with in all these different countries. Um, not being a uh, laziness disease anymore, it's just a disease. Questions? <laughs> Professor, given the reality that this data was collected in 1910, there had to have been a gender and race breakdown on the gathering of the data. So was, was that available? In the, it was not. It was just a per head count test. No. I can't believe it. There's no not race the and gender. Nope. Wow. That's, it's amazing, but uh, they just, either it was politically unwise or they just didn't bother. Was there any correlation between the hookworm infestations and being uh, farmland? Because I know you looked at the drainage and the soil composition and such, but was it more typical where uh, the farmers were in the farmlands? Or? They, they did say in some of the anecdotes about it that um, the farming areas were more heavily infested than city areas or you know where people actually 
may have worn shoes more or they had some pavement or they, you know, had less occasion to go around barefoot or whatever, but they just mentioned that that was the case, yeah. But there's not, that's not recorded in the data either. Most of the places where they went apparently were rural areas. Except where they went into colleges and grabbed students out, you know. <laughs> there was a linguist one time named Raven McDavid who you could talk to him and he could tell you what city you were from, what neighborhood, even what street. Amazing. You said that this fella could tell by looking at somebody where they were where they were from. Tell me more about that. Were there different symptoms? Or well, different species of the worm or what? Uh, apparently, he could just tell the difference between counties. He just went to the county level and he could say which county they were from based on whether they had a look of hookworm infestation. And it didn't really explain exactly how he was doing that, but it's... I mean, what would be the difference between Pamco County and Pitt County? I don't know. <laughs> the, the height of uh, boots, I guess. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you all very much. I appreciate your attention.